Warning, viewer discretion is advised. Some disturbing content and themes are discussed in this film. see the mud brick that would sit on top of the base we'll walk around and you can we can you can walk in and one of the mud brick gates from the 17th century Canaanites it's just like right there um, uh, yeah I know <coughs> it's crazy you'll be walking on some mosaics and they'll be like aren't these like protected and they're like no it's only fourth century <laughs> <laughs> you're like seriously in the United States we'd be yeah, yeah you know how that goes okay <laughs> But there are, there are 14 towers like this. This is a Canaanite, uh, so this is 17th century. It gives you an idea. Now, um, I don't want to knock this out. I wrote down a couple of, uh, this is this site, Gezer, is is listed in the Merneptah Stele, you know, down in Egypt. It's listed in, in up in Babylon. So this is listed, uh, uh, for example, down in Egypt at Karnak, it's listed as one of 11 cities on the trade route. And so it's noted. I mean, it's, it's not like a wimpy little city. So you're, they're coming up this way, and Egypt knows about Gezer because you got to control it. Um, Canaanites, pretty big. If it's got 14 towers and a, a wall this size, it's significant. Now the wall would keep going like this all the way that direction. There's another wall a little bit lower down, uh, and there's another wall that's just a little bit outside this. It's Solomon's Wall, further down. The huge water system which there was not a water system big enough to supply this as this big of a of a fort until they discovered this was much bigger than they thought so what you could do is you can walk down this path it's not open you're gonna have to glance down underground but so go, go ahead go down this path and around down the steps and it'll stop you eventually <laughs> we are now heading down to one of if not the oldest and largest water systems in the world dating back to the Bronze Age. This Canaanite marvel, along with the rest of the ruins of Gezer, was unearthed by Irish archaeologist R.A. Stuart McAllister in the early 1900s. Unfortunately, due to a collapsed retaining wall, the water system filled with dirt and debris, remaining in such a state for over 100 years. In the 20 teens, a new dig revealed the Gezer water system once more. Further excavation of the long diagonal tunnel has brought about the discovery of a cave.
Hey everybody, we're here at Gezer in Israel, and um, Solomon actually um, had Pharaoh come in and um, destroy this place. And basically, um, that was a wedding present to him, if I remember correctly. And pretty much, um, this was a great strategic area because you could see the Ilan Valley, which is a smooth route to Jerusalem. You can also see the Mediterranean Sea. And um, this just sort of, um, just sort of like uh, shows the shrewdness of Solomon and his leadership style. And behind me is a cave. It goes down about 100 yards. And um, you can hear bats and pigeons and things in there. But this is a very um, dynamic place, very interesting place. And um, it's important to the Egyptians. It's important to people in Israel. It's important to people throughout the Middle East. So, um, and, a and Africa as well. So thank you for checking this out with me. All right. Where are we, Corey? We're gonna do is we're gonna walk up and over. We're gonna go down. We're gonna go back to the 18th century BC. Okay. Understanding the context of the, of the story because so often we'll put it in our 21st century mindset and Western mm -hmm. concept child sacrifice was normal it was normal take a look up at Topheth jars t-o-p-h-e-t-h -E I'll show you pick some pictures of them coming up Topheth jars they are all over the place they're in Egypt they're in Lebanon they're in Beirut they're in Moab they're in, they're in Haifa they're all over the place they are jars that you find with the remains of sacrifice, people sacrifice. And they're not just babies. They go from, you know, like about a year old all the way up to 13 years old. I say that for this reason. When Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, that's part of the world in which he lived. And the idea that you would appease or satisfy the God that you worship or some God in the area where you are by that. We have many stories. For example, there's one story on the creed that was under siege and they were losing. And they decided the reason they were losing is because they were sacrificing the babies of the poor people. So then they had the babies of the rich people that they took and sacrificed. And they figured, well, if we're, we're offering, you know, bad offerings at first, so let's offer some, some more expensive offerings. And so they do that. But that is normal across the idea somewhere in the subconscious of human thought, it's going to take a blood sacrifice to appease a God. It's, it's in there deep. The Aztecs, the Incas, everywhere around the world, China had it. You think, how is this that everywhere has it? Somewhere in our subconscious, it's going to take a human sacrifice in order to be okay to God, to make them happy. So when Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, it's very likely, because remember, through you, all the nations will be blessed. Through your offspring, it is possible, very possible, that Abraham is saying, this is the one. This is the sacrifice. And so he goes to make the sacrifice, which God stops. And in that action, shows the people of Israel, it is not a sacrifice you're going to make. 
It's a sacrifice I'm going to make. And so the stopping of the sacrifice of Isaac puts that throughout all of the Israelite story. No human sacrifice. And this is with the first patriarch, right? Abraham. So from the get-go, God sets this up this way. One of the abominations of child sacrifice, I'm going to be really Lutheran here. One of the abominations of child sacrifice is that it substitutes a human work for only what God can do. And so while it's awful that you're sacrificing and killing children for this, the bigger problem is that it begins to be what, what we can offer instead of what God offers. And so while it's abomination of desolation, sometimes we think, oh, well, and then we try to make the equation of that with abortion, you know, in the United States today. Oh, man, the picture biblically is so much bigger than that. It's, it's not about that per se. It, although the dignity of human life is in there, but it's seen from another perspective, from human life, the dignity of human life, because God joins himself to humanity and sacrifices himself. And so we, we shouldn't do that direct correlation because the bigger picture is that it is by God's sacrifice, not, not human, which was normal everywhere. And by the way, how long a walk is it from Beersheba where Abraham starts to Jerusalem where he goes to offer Isaac? Three days. And on the third day, he receives his son back from the dead in resurrection. And that's the beginning of the resurrection motif in the Old Testament on the third day. And it happens right with the first patriarch. Because it says, you know, uh, uh, even the great creed out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, he's risen on the, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Right? And you go like, well, where is that exactly in the scriptures? Where does it say that? And the answer is, this is a motif that's over and over again, that on the third day you get resurrection. And it starts with the patriarch Abraham, who comes to offer to make the sacrifice. God stops it, and he receives his son back on the third day as from the dead. So that's a Hebrew passage, right? You want to comment on that? I was thinking the wedding of Cana is on the third day, too. Yes. But, I mean, that is very interesting in that sense. And that is, I have to say that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and child sacrifice still goes on today, too. Yes. Uh, I say one of my friends in Uganda, she uh, still walks uh, for, against child sacrifice and stuff. Like that. Say, t talk a little bit about that because we are so, it's so foreign to us because we're in the Western world, right? So there, they, they have the same idea that if you can um, have strong enough juju, right, uh, you can uh, triumph over your enemies, whether it's politics or whether it's business or whatever. Babies, or they might use uh, albino, something like that. Anything to get kind of that that power in the party. Yeah. So that's that's kind of sacrifice ideas. Is very uh, ingrained in us. Like yeah. Albino was the norm. Was the norm for child sacrifices like the firstborn, or was it multiple? Multiple. Yeah. It was multiple. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't just firstborn. So you could give up multiple children. You could. Now you said they you say the poor weren't good enough had to go for a wealth person. So there's obviously the mm -hmm. you know the downcast inside they just grab somebody. I mean that's what they were doing, right? Just right. grabbing anybody else's. Right. You say we're not familiar with child sacrifice. I'm just curious why or or if there's an appropriate way to talk about how we sacrifice babies to our own God of comfort in abortion. Is that really different. There's overlap. There's overlap. Well, I think you can find parallels in three. Um, I don't think you have to say one against the other. It's yeah. just this adds an extra layer to it that we often don't think about. And I think that's, and the whole idea of the first commandment being love of God, right? Trust him. They do horrendous things throughout the Old Testament. And you go like that, they're just all messed up. 
Yep, but they have the right God, and they trust him. I mean, King David. You know, you know they're always in the Sunday school chart, King Saul, thumbs down, King David, thumbs up, King Solomon. Oh, we're not sure. You, you know? And you go, when you, when you get to it, you go like, well, I want to be like King David. Uh, on his good days. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, but he always had the right God. That's the difference between David and the other two. He always had the right God. Yeah. Saul, Saul ends up in a witch at Endor, not knowing which God to, to look to. Solomon is sacrificing to Moloch and Milcom. And, uh, but David always knows who God is. He always knows his God. Is that true, like with Moloch, that it was a hollow God where they would heat it up to? Yes. And, um, he had his arms like this. Yes. And they would put the babies in the arms of the God. Just, uh, metal, metal arms. Yeah. They would heat up. They would heat up. Yeah. Oh, alive? They would heat the baby up alive? Yeah. The baby had to be alive because it's a sacrifice. Yeah, I thought they were. the relation of child sacrifice to the culture in which that, that happens. And what kind of sound is this? It is. It's a real place. Live street. 